This is Sophie Wilson, and you are listening to the Slow Boat Sailing Podcast. Hello, this is Linus Wilson. Welcome to episode 10 of the Slow Boat Sailing Podcast. In this episode, we have the crew of SV Delos, Brady, Karen, and Brian. We spend most of our time actually talking to Brian because Brady's away, but also because, you know, the story of Delos is primarily the story of Brian uh, because many of the people we had on, Karen and and Brady, were not on for the full trip. But that doesn't mean that the success of the voyage is not due uh, to their efforts and the success of the YouTube channel is not due to their efforts. I think definitely Brian owes a lot to both his, his partner, Karen, and to his brother, Brian, uh, for making both the voyage and the, the YouTube channel of SV Delos so successful. It's my hope that other crew members such as uh, Brady or Karen will be able to give us an update on SV Delos' adventures in the Indian Ocean at the end of this season or crossing the Atlantic after probably next season. You know, I think that people contribute to uh, great YouTube channels like SV Delos, not just because of the wonderful editing, uh, wonderful pictures they bring back, but it's also because they like to see people inspiring others to go out and go on the cruise of their dreams. And the reason why I'm doing the current campaign on patreon to support the podcast Uh, we have a very modest goal of twenty dollars the reason why i'm doing that and giving away a copy of uh, my first book slow boat to the bahamas not just to the people who contribute to the patreon campaign but to everyone is that i think that the people that are contributing to these various sailors they're doing it because they they want to encourage sailing, not just because they are interested in the story of that sailor, but they they like uh, what they're doing and they think more people should do it. And it's that public spiritedness that I'm trying to appeal to here uh, to help uh, support the podcast, to pay for its hosting, to pay for its internet and, and remote ports. And so... By contributing just a dollar, you can give away uh, cruising dreams to other sailors, not just through the podcast, but also through my book that really shows how you can go from no sailing experience to going on the cruise of your dreams and how to go about doing that. Slow Boat to the Bahamas is a funny look at going on the big trip with a four-year-old and a four-pound dog. But there are also great incentives for people that are patrons of the podcast and contribute on Patreon. And in the show notes, there's a link. It's uh, Patreon slash Slow Boat Sailing is our Patreon site. You can get all kinds of freebies, uh, which are great values, which are worth far more than your actual contribution. That being said, I think that most of the contributors, they come in at it with a public spiritedness mindset that they're not in it for themselves. They are in it to promote sailing, and that is why uh, they are patrons of podcasts. They are patrons of YouTube channels such as SV Delos. My focus in this podcast is to provide great content regularly on a weekly basis now i i don't want to give you the wrong impression to think that slow boat to the bahamas will be free anytime soon the response to the announcement of the campaign was underwhelming and it might be a long time before your fellow sailors pick up that public spirit in this mindset the books are selling well but it looks like people would rather buy the book then give it away to other sailors and so the patreon campaign may take some time 
to me, the, the best is SV Delos is when it shows Brian and his crew members struggling with the real issues that cruisers always face, uh, such as Brian MacGyvering some sort of part to get it working that, that is essential for the operation of the boat, or their more recent episode about them changing out the standing rigging before their Indian Ocean crossing, or dealing with the absurdities of customs and immigration in other countries. When I create content, whether it's through my writing, uh, both for magazines and books, or for this podcast, I always try to create something that I would be proud to have my five-year-old daughter listen to. But not all artists and creators hold that standard and the world's a wonderful place because of a diversity of opinion. Certainly Delos has done some amazing even journalistic videos. For example, when they were in Borneo in the Philippines and they filmed the devastation of dynamite fishing on reefs or more recently when they were in Thailand and talking about the exploitation of elephants. You know, I think they're doing a lot of good there. Without further ado, let's speak to the crew of SV Delos. I've got Karen here as well. Okay. Hi, Karen. And Brady, Brady is out uh, riding, he's out running errands on the motorcycle, and I think he got delayed someplace. He's buying a surfboard cover right now, so he's, he's on his way back, but I don't think he's going to make it for the talk, unfortunately. Yeah, Brady mentioned that he, there was going to be three of you guys, and so are you planning on your trip from Cape Town uh, with the crew of three, or are you going to have more? We're definitely going to have more. We just finished the crew I Want to Be a Delos Pirate competition. It just finished, what, day before yesterday? And uh, we're really excited. We're going to start looking through the videos today, in fact. And our plan is to pick people from, you know, our favorite ones that we found, like, got a little bit of inspiration from. And we're going to uh, basically pick a few of those. And they're going to join us for different legs from the season. And uh, what we're really hoping is to get some South Africans uh, for the first leg, which will be from Cape Town to Reunion, because it would be quite convenient uh, for them, you know, just to jump on the boat and then flying from Reunion back to like Johannesburg or something is actually a pretty easy flight for those guys. So we've got a couple of South African submissions. I know that and totally stoked to take a look through those. But I think there'll be at least five of us, maybe six of us for the for the first part of the leg, the first trip. We'll probably spend the next like six months doing another lap of the Indian Ocean because we just loved it so much. And there were some places that we didn't get to see and one in particular, namely Madagascar, that we really enjoyed so much that we want to go back and spend some more time there a second season. So we'll leave like South Africa in about three weeks from now, like the middle to the third week of April. And then we'll sail to Reunion and Mauritius and then back to Madagascar and through the Mozambique Channel, which will put us back in South Africa like next November. And uh, so we'll spend the next holiday season, like Christmas and New Year's of 2017, or I guess the end of 2016, hopefully in Cape Town again. And then we'll sail across the Atlantic, like early 2017, probably leaving South Africa, like uh, should be February or so. And then we'll hit like Namibia, St. Helena, Ascension, and then across to Brazil, and then up into the Caribbean, which we're pretty stoked about. Okay, so, so it'll be a big year. So you're gonna you've already rounded Cape Agulhas, and you want to round it from the other way, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> and then and then you're gonna, we're gonna see do, we're gonna do it again. You're gonna see Madagascar, Mauritius, and uh, 
then probably come back to Cape Town. Yep. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, which should put us hopefully in Caribbean waters like the end of next year. So like a year and a half from now or something like that. Just we'll try and time it so that we get there right as the hurricane season ends and then we'll enjoy the the season there from like December until May or June. And then we'll be really close to the U.S. again, which would be crazy. Okay, so I think people that have been watching your show, they they last saw you guys in the Andaman Islands uh, at the time of this yep. recording. And so uh, is it a secret where you went between there and now? No, no, not, not at all. Um, it's just kind of a fact that, you know, we're, we actually spend way more time sailing and cruising and filming than we do editing videos. And, you know, the editing for us, we like to put a lot of love and passion into them. So they end up taking us quite a lot of time to do each video. So we're just behind. Yeah, I, I guess my question was, can I ask you where you went from the Andamans to Cape Town to get oh, you here? <laughs> and why are you going to those other places? <laughs> yeah, no, of course. Um, we actually sailed from the Andamans uh, down the coast of Sumatra. Uh, to a little place called Cocos Keeling, which is actually part of Australia. Uh, spend about a month and a half there. And then after Cocos Keeling, we sailed west to Chagos, which is just in the middle of nowhere. Probably the, the closest thing to it is the Diego Garcia uh, military base, which you might have heard of. Um, it's a few hundred miles north of there. Um, but uh, that's a British Indian Ocean territory. And then from Chagos, we sailed to Madagascar, and then from Madagascar to South Africa. Those are kind of the upcoming videos that are coming. Yeah, I've not been able, I haven't read a lot about Chagos or Cocos Keeling. Are there any facilities there for boats? Uh, there is no facilities at all in Chagos. It is, there's nobody that lives there. It's just an atoll, it's a paradise, and... Uh, for the entire month we were there, we were the only people there. So we had the entire place to ourselves. And I mean, there's there's no store, there's no there's nothing, just wow. beaches. Okay, um, cool. <laughs> so it's just the, kind of a yeah, rest no, from the, the the traveling. Yeah, yeah. Um, no airports, absolutely zip. And before that, in Cocos, there is about in the atoll. There's uh, an airport that the Australian uh, government uses to fly uh, rest, search and rescue missions for the Indian Ocean. Uh, so there's about 100 Australians there. And the history of the place is, uh, it used to be a coconut plantation. So back in the 1800s, the family that owned the island, they actually imported a number of Malaysians to do the, the labor and the work on the coconut plantation. So there's like a resident population of their descendants of about 500 Malaysians on one island. Uh, there's like, I don't know, there's a, there's a lot of islands there, but only two of them have populations. And we were anchored at a third one called Direction Island where there was, there was really nothing. But um, yeah, it's just anchorages and, and a beautiful place. But there are, we could buy some food and stuff, but although it was terribly expensive. But in Chagos, it was just fishing and catching our own and, everything that we uh, did the provisioning for, the big provisioning when we left Thailand. That's that's why we kind of provisioned for six months because we knew it would be pretty slim pickings once we left Asia. Uh, can, can you buy, for instance, diesel in the Cocos Keeling? Yeah, you can buy diesel, although I believe it was something like, how much, how expensive was it? It was $3 a liter, I want to say, or... That was four Australian dollars a liter. It was four, so that was, what is that, $16 a gallon? It was crazy expensive. Is, is that Brady in the background? Yeah, Brady, Brady okay. just rolled Yeah, I just rolled it up, man. Hey, Brady. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I got I got stuck behind a slow truck on the bike, and I got stuck by a bee. Oh, no. Did you? Let me see. Well, I don't know. So oh, it's something. You can see it's red. Something fits you. Uh -oh. I on the bike and I got this nasty sting and had to pull over. Oh, <laughs> man. Are you allergic? No, I don't think so. I, well, feel, I don't feel it right. I guess we'll find out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Watch for his face swelling. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah, I guess that's an interesting question. Do you guys have uh, like EpiPens on board or anything like that since you guys are the Blue Water Sailors? Yeah, yeah, we've got EpiPens and a pretty good first aid and medical kit that we've collected of stuff that we've, you know, thought found useful over the years, like a good selection of uh, bandages and suturing and a skin stapler and, uh, you know, an injectable medications you know we have antibiotics and painkillers and yeah quite a few quite a few things in fact we just renewed a lot of our subscriptions or prescriptions with the doctor here in cape town so we found a uh, a marine doctor and we just went into him with all our you know expired uh, azithromycin and amoxicillin and cipro and cephalexin and all the all the ones that you know treat different things and um got them refilled so yeah we do have a pretty good stock on board so from the Andamans, you went to the Cocos and Chagos, and then you did not stop in Madagascar. No, we did. We did. We, did. we, we okay. stopped there for about two months, and okay. we were just kind of enamored by it. It's a big so place. Go, it's huge. <laughs> and honestly, it's like some of the, the best cruising sailing we've ever seen. It was just like these amazing beaches and like smooth 10 to 15 knots onshore and offshore winds they come up they start during the day at about 12 or 1 and then they go till 8 or 9 at night and then at night the breeze lays down and almost goes away so you have these perfectly still flat just dreamy anchorages and then the next day it starts again just like clockwork so you can kind of just do day trips hopping up and down the whole coast and you know, the big swell of the Indian Ocean is blocked by the, la the land mass of Madagascar. Um, so it's, it's really cool sailing. It's very comfortable. Okay, and so you were on the, uh, I guess, west side of Madagascar, because you don't want to be on the east side because of the swell? Yeah, well, most, mostly the northwest side. Um, although when we go back, we're going to start on the east side, a little place called Isle Saint Marie. And from there, we'll go up the East Coast, around the North End, and then back towards the Nosy Bay area, where we spent a lot of time last year, and probably spend most of our time there again, but definitely explore some of the East Coast this time. Okay. So, maybe I could take a step back, Brian, and could you take me back into your decision-making, or actually just take me back into your sailing background before you bought Delos? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it actually wasn't a lot, to be honest. I mean, I, when I was, uh, like, my last year in university, I went to the University of Washington to study electrical engineering and had this little apartment um, that was kind of on the southern corner of Lake Washington in a place called Kirkland, and it had a boat dock. And uh, one of my, my other brother, um, Brett, was visiting from Orlando and he said, you know what, well, you should have a sailboat. And I said, you know, that's a great idea. I should have something because we live on this beautiful lake. And we looked in Boat Trader online and found this tiny little Catalina 22 that happened to be just a few blocks away from where I lived. And, you know, it was like, I think two or three thousand dollars, like super cheap. So I bought it, it was on a trailer and we launched it and uh, got the, the owner to take us out for like an afternoon and help us put the rig up and you know brought us a bottle of champagne and we drank it sailing around and you know I sailed that boat around the lake for like oh, it must have been like five years or something five or six years just cruising that around but you know it was a good boat for like it really was like camping you know you had like a little porta potty in it and you couldn't stand up inside no water no electricity um, so you could maybe spend a night on it but you wouldn't want to stay longer than that and uh, I really did enjoy that, and I wanted to do longer trips, so I bought a Catalina 36, which is my first proper cruising boat. And, you know, that's at 36 feet. It had an indoor diesel engine, and it had water storage and batteries and, you know, sailing instruments, and you could actually spend, like, you know, maybe five or six days on that pretty comfortably. Um, and I sailed that one around for about two years, and then when I decided that I was going to, leave and take a little break from work and life and, and 
go explore some of the world than I bought Delos, and it was just a massive, massive step up. You know, the difference between the 36-footer and the 53-footer was just astounding, and suddenly it, it became a home. It was somewhere that, you know, you didn't go to for just a few days or maybe a long weekend to go sail around the Puget Sound, but it was something that you could literally live on wherever you went and, and have all your creature comforts with you and and travel in a very kind of like cool and slow way and really absorb yourself into the culture and meet people and take your time and you know that's that's what I love about it but it was it was quite a learning curve going from you know the step up from the 22 footer to the 36 footer and then moving on from there but um, you know I really didn't do any formal training I, I took a few classes but I didn't get my uh, you know Coast Guard skipper's ticket or you know, an ocean yacht master or anything like that. I just kind of learned as I went and made plenty and plenty of mistakes, but tried not to repeat them. Yeah, it was it was a blast. It was really addictive. So maybe you had a, a little bit more big, I mean, before you got Delos, you had a 36-foot boat, so there, the loads on a 36-foot boat are, are a lot bigger than the loads on a 22-foot boat. So you yeah. maybe kind of worked up into your big boat experience. Yeah, no, and I, I, and I think one of the, the things that really helped me the most is right when I bought Delos, I, uh, I joined a race crew in Seattle, and it was at first a, uh, a Santa Cruz 52, which is, you know, they're boats that are built kind of for doing, like, ocean passage sailing, and they're routinely sailed from, like, um, like Victoria to Maui or the Transpac, and it's kind of that class of boat. And you have a crew of like, you know, 10 to 12 guys and girls and everything's like really hardcore. And that was a real eye opener. I mean, I really saw the conditions that a boat could take. And I got to, you know, ex like experience sailing with some really like world class sailing professional type guys and, you know, paying attention to like sail trim and, and you know, just basically like open ocean sailing was was just super cool. And I, I probably learned more about sailing in the two seasons that that I sailed on that boat with than, than anything before, just because you're always pushing those boats to the limits and you feel what it's like to knock a boat down and to have it go over on its side and how to recover from that and, you know, how to trim and how to change sails and how to read weather patterns. And yeah, that was, that was probably the biggest help to me personally. Still, it's a, a big difference being a crew on a boat versus being the skipper slash jack of all trades, right? Yeah, no, it's it's a huge difference. But I think what I learned, the most important thing is that, you know, if you take care of the boat, then she'll take care of you. And the boat can take way more punishment than you can. So, you know, when you feel a big wave hitting the side of the boat, you're thinking like, oh, man, that's like, how can this piece of fiberglass held together with epoxy, you know, with this mass held by wires, what are the forces and the leverage and how can it possibly take, you know, winds gusting from 20 knots to 50 knots and then back as you come around a corner and the boat lays over and, you know, it can, I guess the difference is to, to kind of like project when those things are going to happen and try and think a little bit ahead in the future and know that, you know, as long as the boat is okay and most of the time it will then you're going to be okay as well. So it's, it's actually really comforting. I think my longest sail previous to this trip was my friend Brad, who I actually raced with on that boat. He bought a cruising boat in Hawaii, and he was looking for a crew and, to bring it back from Hawaii to Seattle. And so I volunteered from that, and he was a really experienced skipper. He'd done like a number of uh, Trans-Pacific crossings, so we jumped on board and... Uh, Hawaii and set out on, I think it was a 16 day sail to Seattle. And um, that was my first long, long, you know, open ocean passage. Once again, I was the fourth guy and there was three other really experienced dudes on there. And yeah, that was a real eye opener as well. I mean, that's a long time at sea, you know? Yeah, I think it's definitely good uh, to get some offshore trips. Uh, and I think that's, that's very doable uh, for anybody who's willing to do it. I'm interested in your choice of the uh, Mel. I, I think that 
Amel should send you guys royalty checks or something because there are so many people that say they want an Amel now. Just from my looking at it, for a big boat, it should have kind of less loads because it's got the, it's a catch, is that right? Yep, yep. So it's kind of got the lower sail area because you got it, the rig split up. But, and obviously you got those uh, two poles that are uh, integral to the, the boat, uh, which makes life easier. Um, what, what were some of the other uh, qualities of the ML that attracted it or attracted you to it? Well, I, when I was looking for a blue water cruising boat, I looked for a long time. It was like a two year process almost. Almost the entire time I had my Catalina 36, I was looking at, you know, it's like the bigger boat syndrome, right? I was looking at like the next step up. So yeah, knowing my plans. And I ended up going to a cruising seminar in Seattle, uh, put on by Mahina Expeditions. I don't know if you've heard of those guys, M-A-H-I-N-A. Yeah. But they do a lot of seminars. They do like paid crew to take you around and teach you how to do offshore coastal passage making. And I went to one of their seminars and they had a list of uh, boats that were not only capable of blue water sailing, but were also a good value for the money. And uh, the amount was like, right up at the top of that list and i had never heard of it before you know i had been looking at everything from like you know the catalina 44s to like um hansei to um what else did i look at tartan yachts i looked at tayanas i looked at halberg rossi um i looked at swans i looked at you know just about everything that i could find at a boat show and then i started doing research into the well and started looking at their kind of their design philosophy and the type of systems they ship with standard and you know they're they're actually quite impressive because Amel's kind of view on it is you know we're going to build a cruising boat and we're going to evolve the design over a long period of time so they started building these uh we just looked at one here in south africa that's like the little brother to this boat it's an Amel. what was it a sharky sharky and that was what 39 feet or 40 feet I think it's a 39. 30, yeah, something like that, 39 or 40 feet. But the similarities between that boat, which was built in the early 80s, and our boat, which was built in 2000, are like astounding. You know, so over a, a course of like, you know, 20 some odd years, they just uh, continue to improve the design, make it bigger, uh, improve the layout inside, figure out what systems people really wanted. So, when you buy one of these, you get freezers, you get fridges, you get electric winches, you get um, a nice driving station, you get the electric furley on the main and and the Genoa. Uh, There's a big water maker, like the water maker that ours came with is makes like almost 200 liters an hour. So it's like, what is that? 50, almost 50 gallons an hour. So it's a huge water maker. You get a generator, you get dual battery chargers, and all of this stuff just kind of comes stock. So when I looked at the cost of buying a used ML versus buying a, you know, maybe like a little bit newer other boat, but then outfitting it to the standard of the ML, I would have spent way, way more money and also the time in kind of getting everything together. Uh, so I kind of saw it as like, wow, this is a capable boat. I'm not super experienced, so she'll be able to take care of me. Um, and uh, it's got all the systems I want. It's definitely on the larger side of boats. You know, I was really looking at things in the 40 foot range. Um, but when I saw Delos on the dock, I just sort of fell in love with her and had to find a way to make it happen. And Delos was her original name or did you change it? No, 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 Delos was the original name. and. The original owners uh, bought her in new in La Rochelle, France, and then sailed her across the Atlantic and uh, then across the Pacific to New Zealand and then back to Seattle over the course of, I think it was a six year cruise for them. And they had just arrived and put the boat up for sale and it was the only one for sale on the West Coast. And I went for a look and then I thought about it for like a month and then made an offer and I guess the rest is history. Okay, so when you left the dock, uh, what year was that? Uh, let's see, I bought Delos in 2008, and then 
a year later in August of 2009, I left Seattle and made that big turn south. So it was, I had about a year of living on Delos at the dock and then doing like little shakedown cruises around the Puget Sound and up into the San Juan Islands and Desolation Sound and, and Canada and stuff. And that was really cool too, to, to have the boat for a year before taking off and you know, getting settled in, getting comfortable to doing short sails and seeing how everything worked. And yeah, I think that was a good choice. And you were working during that year too? Yeah, yeah, I was still working at, at, the, <laughs> at the company with my partners and uh, putting away money. But I was, you know, I was, to be honest, I was probably like halfway mentally checked out already just dreaming about tropical islands and beaches. And my head was more on the sailing game than in the, software business game i think it's fair to say and then who was your crew when you left in 2009 so i had uh, a couple guys from my race uh crew with me so there was like um two guys from the race crew their girlfriend and then uh my partner at the time Aaron, who actually sailed on the boat um all the way to uh to new zealand for like the first year Oh, wow. Okay, so in the first year, you went to New Zealand. Yeah, it was like, you know, we, we left in August, and then, you know, if you time the seasons right, you head down the west coast of the U.S., uh, you leave in the summer, and then you hang around in California, and you kind of wait until the hurricane season ends in Mexico. Right. So uh, where did you wait out the hurricane season? Um, so I think it's like, if I remember correctly, it's like uh, october uh, it was we were hanging out in like each and like the Channel Islands, um, San Diego for a couple of weeks, sort of that, just kind of getting the boat ready to leave the states. Okay. Uh, and then it was like six months in Mexico, so I think we spent October through uh, through March, like the end of March in Mexico, kind of exploring like the Sea of Cortez and La Paz and Puerto Vallarta and all those sweet places. And then Brady actually joined during that time. He left uh, university and I uh, was gonna come and, and join uh, me and Aaron, who was my partner at the time, to sail across the Pacific to uh, French Polynesia. So it was gonna be the three of us. And then, um, yeah, I guess the rest is kind of history because Brady decided that he was going to, uh, to stay and sort of like missed his flight back and he's still here. Right, so it was, 2009 when you first landed in New Zealand or was it 2010? Uh, let's see, it would have been 2010, like October of 2010. Okay. You know, because if, yeah. if you leave Mexico in March, then you're working in the, the southern hemisphere, you switch seasons, right? So you go from uh, coming into spring in the northern hemisphere to going into uh, fall in the southern hemisphere. And you basically have all the way until like November-ish to do the South Pacific. So we did from like March to November and then ended up in New Zealand for the, the South Pacific cyclone season in, uh, it's like the end of October, I think we got there actually, of 2010. So what was your last port in Mexico? It was basically La Cruz, which is just on the other side of the bay from Puerto Vallarta. Okay. Then you went straight to the Marquesas, or did you go to the Galapagos first? No, because we, we were pretty far north. Yeah, um, too far. Okay. Leaving from Mexico, so we went straight to the Marquesas. And that was, yeah, that was the first big night. That was like 3,000 miles and a total of 19 days at sea, I think. And then you, you went to Tonga, Fiji, and then was that your route? Yeah. Kind of, yeah, from the Marquesas, you generally work your way west and you do, you know, spend, you get a, at that time we got a three month visa. I'm not sure if it's the same now, but we, we spent a month in the Marquesas, a month in the Tuamotos, which are really cool atolls and awesome for diving, and then a month in the Society Islands, which are probably the most famous ones because that's where you get like Tahiti and Bora Bora and, you know, Rayate and all these exotic Polynesian islands. Um, and basically, when your visa expires, then you head west through the Cook Islands, and then you make it to Tonga. And then when you're in Tonga, you have to make a decision about where you're going to spend the cyclone season. And uh, you can either go due south to New Zealand, or you can sail west uh, to Fiji. 
or you can sail really fast west and make it all the way to Australia. Uh, but we didn't want to rush things, and we really wanted to spend more time in like Fiji and Vanuatu. So we spent, you know, got into New Zealand in like October, and then left New Zealand in uh, May, May of 2011. It would have been for our second South Pacific season, which is cool, 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 cool. Okay, I think I watched some of your f- uh, first South Pacific season videos, and what they struck me was they were kind of very dive oriented you guys were i guess new filming that and i i was not i they were not my favorite I, i've actually really enjoyed this stuff later on i i felt like later on in your videos that you were more focused on giving a little bit more of the realities of being on a boat and being a skipper and being having to fix things versus all the wonderful things that you saw which i know you did see a lot of wonderful things do you think that's you think that's a fair assessment or not really oh yeah totally because we weren't into filming at all until actually we left australia so there's almost no footage of our time in like fiji or vanuatu or the solomons i mean we were writing blog posts and stuff but the fact of capturing it on video you know, we did some before that, but it just wasn't the same. We really weren't focused on it. It wasn't, you know, I don't, I don't know. We were just into different stuff. And, um, you know, when we left uh, Australia is when we actually bought a camcorder, a little, you know, a, a little Canon that did a decent job and actually put some effort into trying to document not only the cool stuff you see, but like what the, what the sailing lifestyle is. And I think that's probably what you're referring to is, you know, after our, our little break in Australia, uh, we started on that. Okay, um, because I I think I saw. I, am I wrong? Were there some videos of French Polynesia, for example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was definitely a few. Um, like those giant, but, uh, the giant manta rays, or. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, we weren't doing it. I think at the level that we 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 are now. You know, it was just kind of like we were just kind of messing around with it, but our priority was by far like doing the blogs at okay. that time for whatever reason, you know. Okay, and so Australia was probably 2012. Is, is that when you went to Australia? Yeah. yeah, I think we got there like the end of 2011 because we left New Zealand like May of 2011 and then we for the entire season, which ended. Oh. Uh, you know, November again, so we were, went through Fiji, uh, Vanuatu, and the Solomon Islands, and then we sailed to Cairns, Australia, uh, in northern Queensland, like, it would have been November-ish of 2011, and uh, at that point, we were, like, super, super, super broke, because my, my savings had totally run out, Brady's savings had run out, and, you know, everybody on the boat was uh, just... We were really just scraping by. Uh, so we we sailed down to a little town called Bundaberg, and uh, we parked the boat there, and we rented a car, and we drove to Melbourne, where we had some friends staying who would let us stay in their house for free. And uh, at that time, it was, you know, me and Brady and Yosha, we had met in Fiji, and Karen, we had met in New Zealand, and, you know, she'd come out for... A bit of, uh, you know, she was going to university in Melbourne. Karen was at uh, RMIT. So, you know, she would come out and sail with us for like a month in a place, uh, and then she'd have to go back to university. She was taking little breaks. So when we got to Australia, it was a real good opportunity for us to go back to work, uh, save up a little bit more cash and plan for the next season. And Karen was in Melbourne. We had friends there, so it was like a perfect home base to get away from the boat and like live in an apartment in Australia for a while, which was a super cool experience. Um, I think we were in Australia for a total of 18 months. would have been from like November 2011, all of 2012, and then we didn't leave until uh, like, I think, it was like May of 2013. We left Australia again, so it was a good almost year and a half that we were there. We loved it, really enjoyed it. Saved up a bit more cash, and uh, Karen had graduated university, so she jumped 
on the boat, and uh, it was, yeah, the four of us then, so me and Brady and Yasha and Karen with, you know, random friends that joined along the way as we kind of moved up into Indonesia and the Philippines then. So, uh, Brian, where did you work, or what, what, what kind of field did you work in? So I went back to my partners in the U.S. who were still running the company that we had uh, kind of started together, and I just did remote work from our little apartment in Melbourne. Okay. And I was doing, like, sales stuff, marketing stuff, like, you know, answering emails, Skype calls, writing some code, uh, and all that. That's, that's how I ended up paying the bills and putting away money for the next season. Uh, have you done any of that since or not really? Uh, I s really, when we got into the Philippines, I actually kind of stopped doing that. I kind of wound things down and, and we decided just to see if we could make give a go at, at making a run at the videos and really double our efforts there. And instead of spending time like writing code, I could spend my time editing videos and filming, which I really like a whole lot more. Um, so I ended up taking a loan out of my 401k that I had left over and uh, making a pretty big bet that, you know, I, that money would last long enough to where we could get the videos to a place to where it might actually fund something or at least sustain our lifestyle so we're not burning through our savings all the time. So that, that was the plan. When you were in Australia, the you you were not you didn't you didn't feel like the the videos that you'd compiled was kind of up to the standard and that you could or up to where you wanted to be and you were able to get those so that you could get a lot of interest. Is that it, or was was it already being that uh, your your videos were getting a lot of interest by the time you were in Australia? That, you know, they really weren't, and we just thought it would be a cool project to work on. You know, it would be fun and we could share it with our family and we thought it would be a blast to, you know, be able to look back on these in like 30 years and documenting it in video versus the blogs is just a whole different ballgame. And so we all thought it would be a cool idea to try and there wasn't really many sailing vlogs at the time. Um, in fact, I can't remember if, I mean, we were one of the first in there and, um, which was not very long ago. No, no, that <laughs> right. was... 2013, that was, you're talking about? 2012? Yeah, yeah. That would have been mid-2013. I mean, people have YouTube channels and stuff, but I mean, compared to what it is now, it's, I mean, it's astounding. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Um, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's bizarre to see it grow that quickly. It's really cool. Okay, uh, it's... Yeah, I, you know, I think your videos, uh, you know, are worthy of a, a cable series. The only problem for the U.S. is there's no cable networks that are willing to show sailing. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I, I, I think, I think sailing kind of ranks between badminton and foosball, maybe like the 25th <laughs> most popular sport in the U.S., but it maybe in other countries it's a lot higher. Um, yeah, no, it's, it is a niche thing, and, and um, yeah, I think the, 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 there's a revolution going on on YouTube right now, and you can totally see it because it's the first time that you can cut out the networks, and you can cut out the cable TV and broadcast and all the middlemen, and you can basically be a couple of people anywhere in the world with some fairly inexpensive camera gear. You know, you're not getting like twenty or $30,000 cameras, they're just good quality consumer cameras that you buy on like Amazon or B&H Photo or whatever. And we have standard laptops, you know, they're like gaming machines with lots of RAM in them. And we use off the shelf software and then you buy a 3G SIM card wherever you go and then you upload it and a whole lot of people can see it. And yeah, it does take time and effort, but you know, sometimes me and, and Brady and Karen will sit down here and We'll watch a, an hour-long documentary, like from the BBC or something, and we're like, man, there was like 120 people in those credits. You know, it just blows me away how many people are involved. And, you know, we're just like three people on a sailboat running off solar power and, and stuff. And, yeah, maybe it's not the same professionalism and the same quality, but I think what people are realizing is they can put out content that is pretty darn good. 
and that will hold people's interest and they'll actually watch. And because it's on YouTube, if you're interested in something like an alternative lifestyle or sailing, like you can watch that. And there's no network guy telling you like, oh, you know, not enough people are interested in this, so we're not going to put it up because it's not worth our time. Now you just go directly to it. And I think it's totally cool. Sailing videos have made it onto cable networks. So I think, for instance, the Shards videos, right? They they used to be on the Discovery Network, but now I think they're distributing them through AWE in addition to their their efforts to distribute them directly to their consumers. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that that model is there that, that uh, you know, if you have the videos of the uh, high enough quality, which I think you do, uh, that you probably have more distribution options than you're taking advantage of. But who knows? Yeah, you know, I guess, I guess the other thing to look at, too, is, you know, what we do now is awesome because we enjoy the fact that there's nobody telling us what to do. So if we want to film us changing our rig, we can do that. If we want to film us going to a ping pong show, we can do that, even though some people might find it controversial, like we think it's important to put out there and show, and we don't have anybody telling us, like, focus more on this, put more drama into this. Like, I want to see less of this and more of that, you know, which I guess has its positive sides and it's also its drawbacks because we can put out the message that we want. Uh, but at the same time, like, yeah, our distribution isn't as mass market as it potentially could be. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't think, I don't think the media ma- uh, landscape is mass market at all anymore. Um, no? Whether you're talking about TV or other forms of media. Okay, so, so you spent not many years going around uh, the Philippines up to Thailand. Uh, your kind of Asian tour, as you kind of took a a turn north. Uh, before you kind of crossed the Indian Ocean, that's only been three years that you did that. Because I think yeah, I, I like, think I picked up in your 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 series when you were in the Philippines, and so that was really yeah. when you were putting in a lot of effort to make you know really great videos. Yeah, we were we were really working, started to work on them hard then, um, and yeah, we were in the Philippines for what was it ten months or something. And, you know, we had planned on staying for two months and we just loved it so much. We ended up spending 10 months there. And uh, so, yeah, we were in Southeast Asia from when we left Australia until last uh, March, end of March, when we left Thailand. So, yeah, it was it was a good uh, almost two years, I guess. Yeah. Oh, I, I have one more question for you, Brady or uh, Brian. Uh, and then I wanted to ask a question maybe of uh, some of the other people there. Why is the buddha the symbol of delos was that originally on the the boat no it was actually something that yosh drew on a t-shirt for brainy's birthday when we were in melbourne and i saw it and at that point in my life like i was working really hard on the software consulting thing again like 10 hours 12 hours a day like i went from sailing and doing almost nothing to you know, literally working 60 and 70 hours a week trying to, to get savings built up again. And my work-life balance was, like, way out of whack. It was just crazy. And so when I saw what Yosha had drawn up, I thought it was very cool. And I basically said, hey, guys, like, I think this is a good representation of our project. To me, it means, like, you know, finding peace and harmony and balance in your life. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily uh, meaning that we're Buddhist or anything, although I think a lot of the, the ideals and principles that we try and follow in our lives kind of uh, fall along in those same lines. But, you know, it just, it just is, is a reminder to us to, you know, be chill, take it easy, be peaceful, find balance in our lives, um, try not to work too hard, but work a little bit. Uh, that whole thing. So I, I actually felt it, it fit quite well with our personalities and it's kind of become our, our little symbol now. Somebody wants to support Delos, where would they go? Uh, probably the best place is just go to our website, svdelos.com, 
and uh, on the right hand side you'll see a bunch of goofy pictures of us drinking beer. If you click on that, it's our Buy Us a Beer page, which has all sorts of different options on how you can support the trip. Um, and, you know, it's way more than monetarily, too. You know, just people, like, watching the videos and subscribing to, you know, the YouTube channel and to Facebook, uh, SV Delos, and Instagram. Like, that supports us as well. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the monetary support is, is what makes the trip happen. But just people sharing the, the stories and, and letting other people know about our content is, like, you know, that's just as much support in a totally different way. So we really appreciate that. And uh, wanted to thank everybody for taking the time to watch. So that was uh, the crew of SV Delos, Brian, Brady, and Karen. I had a few more questions for Karen and Brady, and I'll leave those as bonus content for our Patreon subscribers, uh, just because I'm trying to keep the episodes just under uh, an hour or even shorter. Just got back from spring break, and time's ticking down. I'm getting close to taking the slow boat on the Panama trip. I did some engine maintenance, changed the oil, I actually changed the seawater pump with our spare as part of changing the impeller, changed the belts. I also, for the, the fresh water system, for the, the sink and the shower, I switched out the old fresh water pump with a new one. So I have a kind of a spare uh, of the old one. Same thing with the seawater pump for the engine. And... I also did a lot of organizational type things for the boat. I was trying to get rid of all the stuff that was useless on the boat that has just been kind of thrown in nook and crannies and also kind of organized the the storage places within the boat a little bit better so it's a little easier to find things and sort through things. I got rid of a lot of you know, expired medicines and stuff like that, or dock lines that I'll never use. We'll have a ton of dock lines, especially once we give up our slip. So I, I wanted to make sure I had room for all that stuff. You know, the other thing I've been thinking of is that I didn't, if you read, read Slow Boat to the Bahamas and the Exumas, we kind of ran out of food, and I didn't do a great job of kind of remote provisioning because I was pretty used to there always being a grocery store in the next port and I also had the kind of the idea that you know everybody eats but the provisioning options are not great in all parts of the Exumas and in the Bahamas and they're going to be much worse in our trip to uh, Panama via Cuba and so I am kind of thinking of those, that kind of long lasting food. And uh, so I started trying out the canned meat section. Uh, so if you're, you kind of have uh, your Facebook friend of mine, you probably <laughs> have seen the canned meats that I've been trying. My favorites so far are like uh, the canned ham, canned uh, chicken. I'm not a big fan of Spam. I would not put that on the boat. Vienna sausages would not put that on the boat. That's just my opinion. So to find out what uh, we're up to, go to Slow Boat to the Bahamas on Facebook. And that Facebook page that you find in the search box uh, has all the, the preparations that... Uh, the slow boat is making for its Panama trip. You can uh, friend me on Facebook. You can join the slow boat to the Bahamas Facebook group. You can check out all my books and uh, find the links to the Patreon site, of course, on slowboatsailing.com. The show notes are in the blog section of slowboatsailing.com. If you use the iPhone, if you're looking at 
the Slow Boat Sailing podcast in the episode. You can get the show notes by tapping on the three dots to the right of the episode and pressing view full description. And that has all the links. You can check out my book, How to Sail Around the World Part-Time, which dispels many of the myths that keep people from leaving the dock or finishing the cruise of their dreams. Next week, we will have Greg Kutzen of Mantis Anchors, his uh, presentation from the Southwestern International Boat Show Seminar. And uh, that's a great listen. He's a great speaker. I can't wait to bring him to you next week in episode 11. Goodbye for now. Hi, I'm Jana Wilson. Thank you for listening to the Slow Boat Sailing Podcast. Subscribe to our free newsletter at slowboatsailing.com.